singer songwriter BB Snow. Hey, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another free associative episode of Pop Goes the Culture TV. Today, we're continuing with one of my favorite conversations from the vault, singer, songwriter, the late B.B. Snow. If you missed the first part of this one, then go back and watch it and come back. I'll wait. In part two, we'll talk about Poetry Man, being on the second episode of SNL, the birth of her daughter, plus her pseudo-psychic premonitions of fame. When we last left our conversation, Phoebe was telling us about the first time she met George Harrison and why she didn't follow up on a remarkable offer. I, it was stunning, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, it was 1975, a mere 10 years before, maybe nine, I was in Shea Stadium, somewhere up where the helicopters were really hovering close. There were these four specks, these beige specks on the stage, and we had our little field glasses, but forget it. They were, you couldn't see a person. It looked like specks. And I w it was raining. It, it was a really hot day, so it was one of these like little tropical type of storms real fast. I was wearing my brand new, what I thought was very hip, madras shift dress so that I could be with the Beatles in the same breathing space wearing my madras shift dress. I never told you this. And it rained and it was bleeding madras. And my arms and legs turned turquoise. And I'm like, I don't want John Lennon to see me like this. <laughs> but they're specks. We couldn't even hear them. There was like this, you know, people who've been there have talked about this phenomenon. It was all screams and then occasionally you'd hear, you know, and it'd be like, I think I know that one. I think that's help. I need somebody. And so and here I am sitting in somebody's, you know, like a this room and George Harrison is actually saying to me and I'm going like this, do you ever think about co-writing with anybody? And I'm like, "Oh my god." He goes, "Well, here's all my numbers." Oh my god. Did you call him? Did you co-write? What happened? Um, I called him a month or two before my daughter was born. And this is something, I guess I can just touch briefly on this. My daughter, there was a terrible accident when she was born, and she was, she suffered asphyxia, and she became brain damaged. And I didn't call anybody for a long time after that. But I left it sort of hanging. I actually didn't speak to him. I spoke to Olivia, who I'd love to speak to again someday. And I said, yeah, of course I'd love to. They were saying, come on over, you know. The best laid plans. And so, other things going on. Yeah. There was an urgent situation, so I couldn't follow up. But I think about it a lot, especially since now he's passed away, which I no one could believe. That was... I don't believe it. But Phoebe, you've had amazing validation from amazing people. I mean, that's that's just yeah, that's um, stunning. Like, and some some I, people don't even get that close. I know <laughs> to an inkling of that percentage of validation. Regardless I'm stunned. Of what happened afterwards? I am stunned. That moment had to be unbelievable. I'm in awe. Some of the things I met Jimi Hendrix. Did I tell you that? <laughs> no, you did not. I got a million of them. <laughs> Well, this is when I was still in high school, and it was right before he died. And I met him, but I'm not sure he met me. Do you deduce my meaning here? I hear you. Poor Jimmy. You were there. He wasn't quite there. Yes. Hello. I didn't want. I didn't want to touch him, but he was. He was very high, and he was so beautiful. He was wearing one of his fringed buckskin things, and his headband. He was just. He was beautiful, but. He was in a parallel universe at that moment, and I couldn't have been more disappointed. I was like, somebody gave me a phone call from Electric Lady Studio and said, come on down, right now Jimi Hendrix is here. I was like, I'm there, dude. It was like three in the morning, I just stole the car. And I made... Okay, let's talk about songwriting, because that's fascinating, and you, you know, obviously, George Harrison about songwriting. Oh, I, 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 not that I wow. 
the fact that you'd have to talk with me about songwriting is not quite the same sure it is thing. <laughs> but uh, so the second song was a little better than the first let's talk about <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay then your second song was poetry man <laughs> um I know what you, you're probably wondering what motivated that song because there are words in it. People have always asked me, okay, who is it about? It's clearly I'm talking to a married man. In the third verse, I say you're going home to your wife. Okay, what do you want to know? <laughs> what do you want to know? It was someone that you're not going to think they're still. Ah, it's nobody famous. It's nobody famous. I wish I had some salacious, disgusting piece of tabloid trash for you, but no. I understand. It was but a. It, but it's, it's truth. <laughs> it was, it's, there's truth in there. So, at what point, sort of. You don't have to go into the actual story of the person who motivated it. Oh, but you really want me to, though, don't you? <laughs> no, and actually, it's, you know, but, but, but the creativity that motivated it, I mean, to me, what's, what's the most important thing is the, ca the catalyst, the emotion that you feel, the creative impetus that comes from these experiences that you have. That was a remarkable gift, I think, from the universe. I was having a little affair with a, a married man who was much older than me, and um, that song was like a spontaneous, you know, involuntary, it just poured out of me in five seconds because I was like so into this guy. Wow, what was I thinking? But I got a great song out of it. But I am not condoning people having affairs with married people. I have to make that absolutely clear. Um, It'll, it's going to happen whether I make it clear or not. Oh, that's for you. That's that not even mine. for me. I'll turn that right off. I'm going to chill. Goodbye. Take, or get hotter. Whatever I love it here. You're, we're baking the virus out of me. I want you to know. Oh, man. That. Yeah. Turn off. Thank you. That's me. Pretty. For you. Um, Who wrote that? They must be very rich now. Fortune. Oh, boy, are they rich. I wish I'd written one of those. Well, get the, that, they had a, wasn't and, there a hit song that was ri all ringtones recently really? in Great Britain? Anybody know about oh, know. anybody know about this? Anybody? Crazy for that. Hey, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you're when you're writing the songs, do you, do you have a process? Do you use a guitar? Do you use a piano? What's guitar. You? Guitar is still my instrument. I'm not as proficient with it as I used to be. I have a little carpal tunnel, whatever it oh. is. But yeah, that's usually how I write. Sit down in the middle of the night, sit down with a little notebook. Mm. Sit, 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 sit. The lyrics come first for me. So I have like tons of poetry journals and the lyrics usually come from those. And now I've been doing a lot more co-writing. I'm actually working with a couple of people right now who I'm going to co-write a whole bunch of songs with. And I did the last album that I released, which was in um, 2003, was mostly co-written stuff. Who My you words. Who are you with? Just a bunch of song, right? Um, you know, I'm going to name their names. If they're somebody that are on Sure. The show, you know. Well, I'd like to give a big shout out to Drew Yoel. I'm trying to remember who else. Steve Fox. A guy named Kevin Bentz, who is a great keyboard player, writer, singer. Um, now I'm working with a guy named Earl Rose. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to work with him next week. So it's all, you know, experimental, but. I do write on my own, but not as prolifically as I would like to. So, At this point in our conversation, we took a quick break, but when we came back, Phoebe and I reminisced a little bit about one of the beloved teachers we had from our high school, Lori Cohn, a woman whose impact on our lives, on the lives of hundreds of students who attended Teaneck High School, was enormous. Yeah, Lori Can I Lori is, Lori was one in a million. That was my English teacher. One in a million. Me doing video for the first time in really? She was my surrogate mother. One of my surrogate yeah. mothers, yeah. Yeah, well, good. That makes us siblings, I guess. We're all connected. <laughs> that was my first jingle, an AT&T jingle. We're all connected. Do you remember that? In uh -huh. the 70s, that campaign for... I'm just going to drink. Please do. I did fine until they had me read copy. Hi, I'm Phoebe Snow. Lost it. Peed on myself. I was laughing so hard. No voiceovers. Not fun. Not well. Hey. How about SNL? 
That was a big deal, oh, right? Wow. Was it like the second or third episode? Second, the very second one. Tell me that story. Oh, I'll never forget that. That was totally, I met the cast. I hung out with them. I was pregnant with my daughter. A lot of interesting stuff happened around my pregnancy, but they actually were so incredibly kind and nurturing, and they they knew I was pregnant. It was showing at that point. And uh, Franny Lee, who was the designer, the costume designer up there, took me to Bloomingdale's on the break between the run-through and the actual airtime and bought me the most beautiful maternity outfit, this beautiful outfit, and said, now don't jump, jump up and down when you're singing. I was singing with um, Paul Simon and the Jesse Dixon singers, and we had a duet called Gone at Last, and it was this very up-tempo, frenetic kind of gospel thing. And, you know, in the gospel churches, people jump up and it, don't jump. Please, we're begging you, don't jump. But I met everybody in the beginning stages. Did you jump? A little. <laughs> it, it, that, believe me, it was all good. It's a tiny, teeny jumping like this. But, um, yeah. What was it? What were those? What was it like? Uh, I mean, sort of set up for me because it was it was the second organic episode. It was, and it, you know, they it, didn't it sort of talked about that. Right? On Saturday Night Live, the first season, I'm reasonably sure that they had no idea what was about to happen to them. I don't think anybody saw it coming. And they were doing this wonderful sketch comedy and a lot of physical comedy, which had gone from television for a while. Like, there was not a big format for slapstick stuff. And these guys, they had, you know, pitch meetings before, and they'd run over the sketch material, but a lot of it... It was live, and there was no 10-second delay on it or anything, so you really never knew what was going to happen. They were by the seat of their pants. And they were, I'm sure, with Belushi and Chevy Chase and Aykroyd, they were improvising. I know they, to some degree they were. And it was just, you were watching a work of art being created. It was remarkable, and it was frantic. It was chaotic. I think the pace was almost just a bit too much for everybody to keep up with and you've heard all the stories um so i was kind of there and and witnessing the birth of this television format that had kind of gone away for a while which was live sketch comedy everything was pre-taped everything was safe and you know clean and these guys were starting to become outrageous they were bringing outrageousness back to live television and it was what an honor, God, to be there. I mean, they're all crazy. They are crazy. But I, I watched them creating these things that, that became household catchphrases. Mm -hmm. Never mind, you know. I mean, I was there for all that stuff. Because even when I didn't do the show, I would ha I'd ask, can I just come and hang out and watch you guys doing it? I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. And um, what great people, wow. all of them. Doing the, doing the duet with Paul Simon? Yeah. What was that? Uh, well, Paul Simon was very, very good to me in the beginning of my career. Um, he took very good care of me. Uh, I breached my original contract with Shelter Records out of sheer necessity. I had to leave there. And there was an injunction. There was like a... I had a lawsuit against me. I was not allowed to enter a recording studio, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's prohibitive beyond words. So he sneaked me in and he, ch oh, is this going to get him in trouble? Not a, it's well, too it's late now. It's, it's 30, years, 30, 30 years old, the hell with it. But he, you know, changed the time and date of when we, you know, when we signed in and stuff. And that's when I did the, the duet with him. And that's when I was on his album. He was kicking me some work, which was very sweet of him. Yeah. And he was Any taking questions? a risk. Then he brought you in with him on the SNL? Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he obviously had a relationship with all of them and Lauren Michaels. But I was going to say, the original version of that song, uh, this has been printed before. I know it's been printed before. He had done, the first pass that he did was with Bette Midler. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to shelve it. I do not know why. And he said, I'm going to change it up, I'm going to, you know, do it differently. 
do you want to hear what Bette and I did? And I said, yeah. And it was really good. It was excellent, in fact. And I said, um, you know, I'm just a new kid here, but why aren't you putting that out? He goes, oh, we're not putting it out. I don't know. You'll have to ask them. <laughs> and I knew Bette Midler. So um, I felt really weird about it. I was like, do you really want me to do This might not be a good idea. Hmm. Just, just do it. Go ahead. It'll be okay. I don't know. I heard uh, from my, uh, from nobody in particular that uh, you, you've had some premonitions about how other people's careers would go, that being one, one of them, that occasionally you'll get like a little oh. psychic flash. Yeah, Bet was definitely one of them. I, she had been playing in um, a really bizarre club in New York, the Continental Bathhouse, I think it was called. <laughs> you know about that. And then she got her first Tonight Show gig while I knew her. And I knew a group of musicians that all hung out, and she was one of them. We all watched The Tonight Show together. We were screaming with delight. And I, Johnny Carson said, you're gonna, young lady, you're going to be a big, big star. And I knew that when I met her. I had a premonition about that, and I think I told her. Um, I had another really freaky experience about in 1986 or 87, I was invited to go bring my daughter backstage to the Bad Tour with Michael Jackson, and Sheryl Crow was one of the backup singers. And my friend Greg Fillingaines was the musical director on that tour. And I met Sheryl Crow, and she, she was just like kind of hanging out and saying hello. And I said, I just looked at her like this, and I went, wow, you're going to be a really big star. And she goes, me? I'm a backup singer. I said, not forever. And I just found the program, like the big program that they sold, you know, in the lobby, but they just gave me one. And the only signature on that program is Cheryl Crow's. I said, you should sign my program so I can say that I knew you before. <laughs> she rem I, I've seen her since then, and I think she really does remember that I said that to her. But I do this stuff all the time. I have no idea what it is. It's just weird. What do you think when you see him? You're going to be a big star. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to write a check to me for a billion dollars. You won't sign it, though. <laughs> yes, you will. I want your autograph. Um, yeah, no, I've had that happen a lot. I also have these weird things like, I see people on TV and I know I'm going to meet them, and they're people that I would not generally meet. And I, that's happened to me a lot. Um, I'm blanking, but I'm thinking of this one guy, this one way bizarre experience. It was a guy, you might remember this, I don't, I don't even know, it was probably at sometime in the 90s, and it was a guy who was a soap opera actor, and he had been in a plane crash, and he was on all these different talk shows talking about how he survived the plane crash, the plane, it was at LaGuardia, and it was on an icy runway, and it flipped over, and he somehow got out. Of, the plane was upside down, and he got out of the bottom of the plane, and he realized that he, they were in the, the bay there or whatever surrounds the LaGuardia airport, and he walked through the icy water because somebody was standing in front of him going, come on, come on. what was this guy's name? Now, I'm wasting a whole story. because That's all right. Okay, but the anything. but the odds of me meeting this guy were like a trillion to one. I mean, I'm never going to see this guy. But he was telling his story everywhere. He was on Oprah. He was on everything. And we, if you want to go back and do a fact check on this, because I actually would like to remember this guy's name. I go to a party about a month after seeing him, and I, ha I was looking at him on TV and going, I don't know why, but I'm just seeing myself shaking this guy's hand, wow, it's nice to meet you. I'm like, what am I talking about? I'm never going to meet this guy. And I go to this party, and the party's terrible. It's some music industry party, and I'm like, where's the elevator? i got to get out of here. It sucks here. And I'm leaving, and the elevator door's open, and this guy walks out, the plane crash guy. And I went, well, I, I didn't call him the plane crash guy. I called him. I said, oh, my God. You know, I just said, you're, you're the guy. who." And he goes, yes. By this time, I think he probably was feeling rather omnipotent. And he said, I said, I recognize you. Oh, I, I knew I was going to meet you. He goes, well, why are you leaving? Come on, let's talk. And I ended up talking to him for about an hour. 
and he told me every minute detail of this experience that he had. It was fascinating. It was amazing. He saw a guy in front of him wearing, like, a trench coat or something going, come on, you can make it. You're going to make it. And, of course, he gets to, to dry land, and there's no guy. So it was some sort of, you know, apparition or something. Yeah, saved his life because he was deathly afraid. I think he said he was deathly afraid of water. And he never swam. He said, I can't. I'm not going to make it. And he goes, it's only up to here on you. Come on, you can make it. Now, how would he have known that? Like, he thought the plane was floating on deeper water. So I meet this guy getting out of an elevator. And stuff like that happens to me all the time. Not every single minute, but, you know. Something I've happens. had some bizarro experiences. Stuff happens. Oh, yes. Stuff definitely happens. Stuff happens. That's it for now. Next time, the conversation with Phoebe Stowe continues with stories about meeting Soundgarden, Captain Kangaroo, Phoebe King, Phoebe Cates, and what it was like playing for the Clintons. I'm David Levin. We will see you then. And for now, just subscribe. Subscribe. <laughs>